Welcome to Issues That Matter. My guest today is Scott Ritter and Joe Lombardo, and we're going to have a discussion about the movie Cabaret. I had seen it at the Spectrum about a month ago, and then I saw that right in my building, my uh, the guy who plans parties got it, and I found that I found that movie so so interesting, and like you had you had the email me um scott you think that that people really a lot of people won't grasp the meaning of it what do you think well look i i was exposed to it in 1972 when it first came out um you were very young then i was very i was i was 11 years old um but my parents fell in love with the movie and Interestingly, uh, if you remember back in that time, there was this uh, Coke commercial where they had the Hillside Singers singing, I like to teach the world to sing. Right. Well, they put out an album. My mom bought that album. And on that album was a song called Tomorrow Belongs to Me. And um, I loved that song. I'd whistle that song all the time. Uh, and then the movie uh, came, came out. And my parents loved the movie, took, took me to see it. Um, and, you know, they just, they enjoy musicals. They, 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 they loved Liza Minnelli. They loved uh, the other actors. They, they loved Money Makes the World Go Around. They loved the the whole thing. Um, the only part of the movie that actually got anybody that made anybody go quiet was when Tomorrow Belongs to Me comes on. It's sung by, of course, in a, in a, by a, a Nazi Hitler Youth um, in a in a outdoor um, you know, you know uh, restaurant environment, um, and you see the people singing, and you realize that it's a Hitler song, even though it wasn't. It was written in 1966. It has nothing to do with Hitler. It's purely uh, a thing of the movie. But, you know, that made us pause, but then we just, it was more about the entertainment of the movie. That's why I say, look, my parents were career military people. Um, I, I grew up in a family that was very educated. We didn't get it until we moved to Germany. We moved to Germany in 1977. We watched Cabaret again once we lived in Germany. We got it. I'm not picking on Germans, but yeah, I am. Um, you know, they their 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 country gave birth to one of the most odious ideologies in modern in modern history, um, if ever, if not ever. And uh, once you you know were in Germany and you were starting to question this 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 modern Germany that's existing, but yet the guys that you were, were meeting with were 20 years old during there, which meant they fought in the war. Uh, the girls that look like nice old grandmothers were uh, wearing swastikas and doing Hitler salutes for not just a year, two years. We're talking about you know nearly a decade and a half. Um, and and then you watch that movie and you and all I can remember my parents and I talking about because you know now I'm a little bit older. We're saying, man, that could be today. That could be today. Mm-hmm. That there, you know, it wouldn't take much to 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 see you being in a in a guest house environment and having some kids stand up and sing a song and, and watching the Germans go back to being, being that it doesn't take. And then when you extend it to today, I look at the MAGA, uh, you know, um, gatherings, uh, the Donald Trump rallies. And all I can think is some stupid little blonde boy standing up, starting to sing tomorrow belongs to me and see what the crowd does. Um, but unless you've prepared yourself intellectually for that, if you just see the movie right off the bat, I don't know if all that stuff clicks. Mm-hmm. Joe? Well, I saw the movie when it first came out. I was a little bit older than 11 years. Um, I think I had just graduated from college, actually. Um, uh, and I enjoyed the movie. And I did notice the Nazis because I was political um, and had some understanding of what happened in Germany at that point. But I rewatched it. And it did have a lot more meaning for me rewatching it in the last couple of days uh, because of what's going on in Ukraine. Um, w- one of the things was um, a-, a few things in the movie um, and in, in the history. Um, a-, a lot of people thought that the Nazis were not good, but they thought it was a counterweight to the communists and they thought they could be controlled. And this minority movement um, showed it really couldn't be controlled. And you you see what happened in the movie from the first person in in the cabaret that gets thrown out because he has a swastika on 
to that guy getting beaten up, the, the proprietor of that cabaret, to later on in the cabaret when it's filled with people and swastikas um, hung out. When I was in Ukraine, uh, one of the things I noticed about the Nazis and the neo-Nazis that are there, some of them wearing swastikas on their coats and so forth, was that they were young, they were good looking, and it was part of a youth culture and youth movement. Um, and that's what's extremely dangerous in my, uh, my opinion. And I see again, people ignoring it, thinking, well, we can use the Nazis and the Azov Brigade and so forth against the Russians. And when we have to, we can control them. And it's a repeat of history. The Nazis in, in Ukraine have become a pole of attraction for right suprem white supremacists and fascists from all over the world. Many of them have come there and joined uh, them in their, in their wars. And these people get military training and doing that and some experience. And they come back to these other countries and, uh, and, and they can replicate the same thing there. We saw the same thing during the Iraq war, by the way, and, and during the uh, early wars, um, even before that with uh, Al Qaeda. The United States used these jihadists um, uh, to go in and fight the Russians in um, uh, Afghanistan. And out of that grew Al Qaeda, which became a world terrorist movement that came back to bite us at some point and, um, and is, is continuing to bite um, uh, people around the world. So it's a serious thing. And it did show that in the movie, but it showed it in a kind of um, background, not up in, in, front, in your face way, because that's the way you had to do things back then. You know, I remember in the Vietnam War period, which was right around then, we were being accused all the time of being communists and that it was a communist movement. And there were communists and socialists and others that were in the movement, but the vast, vast majority of people were not. And so there were certain subjects you had to talk about very gingerly. And back when that movie was made, I, I think that little bit of history was one that you had to talk about gingerly also. Uh, do you think the way the movie was written. Actually, who do you know who wrote that movie? I know Bob Fosse was involved, but who actually wrote the movie? Do you guys know? Um, I, I don't, my wife does. Oh, and she okay. talked to me a little bit about it. And she said she read that he really did a lot of research in that period. And some of the things we saw going on in and around that cabaret, the um, people being loose with their gender identity, with um, homosexuality, uh, with a number of things was very true of that period, which was a very difficult period for Germany because they lost World War I and they, they were unable to develop and they were in a severe depression for all these years and the Nazis and blaming it on the Jews seemed to be a possible um, way out of that for very many people. And I think that's one of the reasons they adopted this ideology. So looking at the movie, the people that were in the cabaret who was watching it and the performers that were there, were they cognizant of what was going on in the street? What do you guys think? I think one of the interesting things is um, there's been several productions of this, not just the movie, but there's been theatrical productions. And um, in one, um, uh, one of the producers put up um, uh, mirrors so that in, during many of these uh, performances that were supposed to get you to think, uh, the crowd was looking at itself, meaning that they were, they were the observers of what's going on, the implication being that, um, that, that basically we're, we're all capable of being the sheep. We're all capable of sitting back and watching something happen and doing nothing about it. We're all capable of being entertained by by something whilst while while evil is is growing, mm -hmm. um, and I I I I think that uh, you know I think that's one of the main things that the movie was trying. And again, I, I look back on my own personal experience and I realize that when my family was first exposed to it, 
we were being entertained. <laughs> I mean, that was the, we, we loved the music. We loved the dancing. We yeah. loved the entertainment. Um, the last thing we took away from that movie was the, the darker side of it. I mean, there was the one thing, you know, with the, but it wasn't until later. But we watched it at, in, in, in the 1970s. I actually watched it after um, ABC had run a four part miniseries called The Holocaust in 1978. <laughs> In 1979, they played it in Germany, and um, it was amazing. They did it over four nights. So they had to have a panel of uh, experts and psychologists afterwards, and they were getting phone calls after phone calls after phone calls from German youth who were saying, is this true? Is this true? Did this happen? And when they'd say yes, they say, why wouldn't you teach us about this? I hate my parents. My parents did this. I hate them. I hate them. And the psychology the panels were stunned in the silence. They weren't expecting that. And then we saw that, and then we watched the movie again, and we went, oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, look at everybody just sitting there. Uh, and Joe, you know, talk, Joe talks about what's happening today. You know, Joe, the difference between then and you know, the, what's said in the movie is that then Nazi, the Nazis, the, you didn't know the scope of evil that they were capable of. You just knew you didn't like them. But when you look at the Nazis in Ukraine today with the swastikas on, you know, there's no debating what this ideology is capable of doing. This is what stuns me, is that in 1931 in the Weimar Republic, you could sit there and say, well, maybe we can control them. Maybe we can get you know, Ludendorff and, and, and the others to, to control them, um, you know, control Hitler uh, to, as a counterbalance to the communists and the socialists and such. But today, we know what they're capable, and it's not just what they're, what Ukrainian Nazis are capable of. They pulled the trigger on 30,000 Jews in Bobby Yar. They manned the concentration camps. They empowered the death squads. They were the death squads. And yet we're still, after knowing all the history, we're still the stupid crowd in the audience going, oh, we can control them. It's just happening over there. Let's not worry about it too much because we've got this bigger problem called Russia that we have to deal with. No, man, Nazi ideology is pure evil. It can never be empowered. There, if, there's a, if you're against Russia, find a different way. But don't embrace evil, especially an evil that killed so many Russians. Because all you're doing is enraging the Russians. But anyways, I, I just think that we are, you know, let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me put it this way, then I'll leave it with Joe. You know, there was a movie called uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I don't want to give away the ending, a uh, recent Quentin Tarantino movie. Um, but I took my daughter and her fiancé to see it. My daughter was very familiar with Charles Manson and the Tate murders. When she saw the movie, she was hit very emotionally by it. Her fiancé, who was a very smart kid, had no clue. And when he saw the end of the movie, he was just like, okay, it was an interesting movie, but I, 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 I didn't get it. We have to find a way to get Americans to watch Cabaret and get it. Because there is no more meaningful moment than to watch it and realize that you are that person in the crowd watching evil come to life and doing nothing to stop it. Mm -hmm. um, one particular uh, scene in the movie really struck me was I don't know, it was just a character talking to somebody else and they they classified the Nazis as useful idiots. Okay? Useful idiots to stop communism, to stop the Soviets. What do you guys think? And and if that's the case then, that's the case now, right? Well yeah. Um I, I think the people the powers that be understand what they're doing. Uh, there's been a rightward trend in um, politics in the West for a while now. Um, in most countries, there's now a big growth of the right wing, people that are anti-immigrant, anti, um, uh, uh, you know, are racist, are, um, have some of these positions and some of them even openly identify with fascism and Nazism. And I think they're aware of that. But you, you got to think that uh, I think the West is in real trouble. The United States and Europe in real trouble economically. And just as at, where they're getting competition from China, uh, where uh, um, uh, 
you know, their banking system is being challenged, where uh, sanctions aren't working in the way that they thought they were. And um, perhaps they're thinking that a solution like this to go to the right, suppress freedom of speech in this country, which we've all been victims of here, um, uh, allow for the growth of the, of the right wing um, to a certain extent to, uh, you know, um, uh, throw things back uh, um, and uh, build a movement against uh, the, the enemy as we see it um, uh, is not a terribly bad thing. And I think this is, is part of what, what, uh, what we're seeing. So, Scott, what do you think of the phrase useful idiots? Well, I mean, it's, it's an overused phrase. Uh, first of all, it's deeply insulting. Um, uh, first, you know, to, 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 to use that phrase, especially against uh, uh, Nazis, um, is, is to not respect the, um, the capability of your enemy. Um, these people may be evil, but they're not stupid. They know exactly what they're doing. They know how to manipulate societies. They know how to uh, parlay uh, you know, a political minority position into, uh, you know, uh, into political power. Um, and so to call them useful idiots means that you don't have to worry about them. You can just sort of easily manage. No, they're not. They are the most virulent form of societal cancer imaginable. Um, and if you don't excise it immediately, if you don't destroy that which gives, you know, that, 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 that gives it the ability to grow, it's just going to metastasize and destroy society. Just like cancer will destroy a body. Um, it's, it's, it's just a dumb phrase. Anybody who uses that term is, um, is setting themselves up for failure. They're not useful idiots. They're pure evil. So yeah, in, light of, in light of what's going on today and in Ukraine, the mindset of the American people, okay? How many people who watch Cabaret will fully grasp its meaning. What do you guys think? Well, I, I, I think today more of them will than they would have in 1972. Um, uh, and I think that that is important because it did hit me even more today, um, even though I um, uh, said I was political and understood that when I um, first uh, watched it. So I, I do think it will affect more people and I think it would be good for it. And that's probably why it was actually shown again recently, uh, um, just for that um, purpose. There was another point I wanted to make, but I forget it, but maybe I'll come back to it. <laughs> okay, okay. But look, my, my, my feeling on the movie is that if your mind is open, that movie will have a huge impact on you, huge impact on you. Right. But so many American minds today are closed, um, not because they're ignorant, not because they're because they're exhausted. I mean, they you know the, between the pandemic and just the fact that these people are working, you know, 40, 50, 60 hour weeks, they they're juggling life. Uh, it, it, it's hard to have people who are expending so much effort just on surviving um, be able to then sit down and open their brain sufficiently to absorb some very complicated messaging coming from a movie. Um, I think people, I mean, that's why maybe <laughs> the, the current state of affairs in American cinema is the way it is because they just dumbed everything down to, to be pure entertainment. And, um, and, and the movies that make you think maybe don't do as well because they're not a Marvel comic. They're not a DC comic. They're not uh -huh. some stupid slapstick uh, horror flick. Um, I don't know if Cabaret would do well today. Uh, if it was an original release. I mean, it should. It's a classic movie. I mean, it's wonderful. It's mm -hmm. just it's so much depth. Um, but you have to have an open mind. As Joe said, even when he had an open mind uh, coming out of college, his mind is more open today and he, and he got a greater experience. But I don't know if the, the mainstream America is, is, is programmed to accept this movie. The, the scene where you talked about the young man that was singing, uh, when it was shown in my building, the uh, that particular scene, uh, something happened to the, the video, and it just went like bonkers for a couple of minutes. So people started to leave at that point. 
but they were saying, how did it end? And it's like they didn't even grasp what was going on, you know? And, and it's like, I thought to myself, how did it end? It hasn't ended yet, right? Yeah. No, I mean, the evil of Nazi ideology is alive and well and living today. Um, not just in Ukraine. Because remember, you have to facilitate evil. Evil, evil doesn't exist in isolation. It exists as part of a system that tolerates it. And America is the leading tolerator of Nazi evil today in the world. My God, Congress just debated you know, a $40 billion uh, package um, that includes not just $15 billion for military stuff. So, you know, we're paying the salaries of the Ukrainian military which includes the Azov Regiment. We're paying the salary of Nazis. If that doesn't infuriate you, nothing ever will. The American taxpayer is paying the salary of card-carrying Nazis in Ukraine today as we speak. That just blows my mind. And no one, I watched the C-SPAN debate, no one in Congress raised their hand and said, well, can we like... Uh, not pay the Nazis. They just, oh, Slava Ukraina, without even a clue what that means, what that stands for. Glory to Ukraine. Step on Bandera's war cry. You know, the other thing I want to say, uh, Cynthia, is uh, um, the, the U Ukrainian Nazism has come over to the United States, and it's very close to us even. Uh, there's, uh, you know, a very strong um, uh, a movement of uh, the Ukrainian nationalist movement among the Ukrainian population. There's been basically three um, groups of t times when there was immigration from Ukraine. One was right after Ukraine was uh, became part of the Soviet Union. Some people didn't want that left. Another was after with the uh, with the fall of uh, fascism and Nazism, the, a lot of the collaborators left, and a lot of them came were allowed into the United States, and um, now we see another uh, um, uh, movement of Ukrainians in. But there is right near where we live, down in Owenville, New York. There's a Ukrainian camp, and uh, they hold yearly ceremonies of the heroes of Ukraine there, wearing the uniforms of the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, which were the collaborators of the Nazis. And they have statues of their Nazi leaders, um, uh, including Stepan Bandera, uh, right there. And so that movement is alive and well, not just among the white supremacist Americans that we saw raiding the Capitol and, and uh, uh, January 6th or, or down in, in North Carolina, but um, it's, uh, you know, it, it is among these, these Ukrainians here also. So it does exist. It still exists. We're still not dealing with it. And Scott is absolutely right. These are the, um, we have to deal with it in a very serious way. We can't, we can't just uh, close our eyes to it. But the mainstream media is whitewashing this whole thing. And they have no idea that, about the conversation that we're having right now. What's it going to take for, I mean, the people on mainstream media, they must know what's going on, but yet they're lying. Isn't yes. that awful? They've always done that. What do you think weapons of mass destruction were about? That was a lie that they knew about. You know, the, the Gulf of Tonkin incident, which started the Vietnam War, where four, we killed four million Vietnamese, four million Vietnamese were killed in that war. Um, that was a lie, too. That never happened. Never took place. Right. You know? um, so there's many, many lies you get all the time. And voices like ours can't get on to uh, corporate media. And even on social media, which we hope to be able to control and have freedom of expression, we're all getting kicked off and we're all getting put in Facebook jail and we're all, you know, having our content uh, deleted. Uh, they, they know the truth. They don't want you to know the truth. And that's the problem. You know, they should be talking about these Nazis. I can't believe that they're not, but they, 
they downplay it. They say it's not really true. How can a Jewish president be in favor of Nazis? How can, um, uh, you know, it's, it's just an exaggeration of the left, you know. But I'll tell you, when I was there, I saw the torchlight um, uh, uh, marches with them chanting, hang the Russians from the trees. You don't think the Russians are afraid of that or, or, or you know, worried about that? That these people who are in the military, if they got into NATO, might get a weapon uh, and they would like nothing better than to kill the Russians and destroy um, uh, Russia, which is a common goal that the United States has is to destroy Russia. And that's why we're willing to go along with them and support them and arm them. And we use them uh, uh, as a battering ram in, in the uh, 2014 coup, which the U.S. supported, that led to this whole thing. That's that's when this war really started. Um, so, you know, yes, they know the truth and they don't sell the truth and they, they'd be kicked off the TV if they did. I once, um, uh, at the University of Albany, I heard a, um, a weather forecaster speak about climate change. And someone asked him, well, why don't you say this when you see these tornadoes and these uh, uh, stuff that is climate change? He said, because I want to keep my job. He's not allowed to say that. And these people are not allowed to say it either. Uh, there's been commentators on CNN that spoke about Palestinian rights and lost their job. It's very clear that this is what will happen. So do you think ultimately at some point what we're doing here on YouTube will become the main source of information? What do you think, guys? I hope so, um, because, you know, mainstream media is so corrupted. Um, I mean, I'll just throw three names out there. Uh, Alexander Vindman, uh, uh -huh. Victoria Newland, uh -huh. and uh, the Chulapa family. Um, you know, these are Western Ukrainian immigrants who um, are all um, supporters of Stepan Bandera's nationalism, but they're American citizens. They're in the United States, uh, and they play very important roles in uh, influencing policy. Um, it, and their message is being echoed uh, by mainstream media. Uh, the good news is that uh, channels like MSNBC and CNN are losing viewership. Um, they're, they're just collapsing. Um, you know, you're getting 40,000. You know, uh, people like, uh, I mean, I'm not buying into his politics or anything, but Joe Rogan has millions. Of followers. Mm -hmm. um, more, more people are influenced by Joe Rogan than by CNN. Um, you know, let's say your show takes off. You could in, end up influencing, you know, being as influential as, you know, some of the major CNN um, uh, commentators. So uh, mm -hmm. I think that social media is an invaluable platform. The problem is corporations own it. So they're, they're shutting it down. I mean, you know, you, if you say the wrong thing, you could find that your, your channel is, 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 is closed down. You could get banned from Twitter. Um, I know somebody that had that happen to, um, you know, <laughs> so, you know, it, 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 it has great potential, but as long as there's corporate ownership and as long as the Supreme court doesn't extend free speech protections to corporate owned social media outlets, um, you know, you're, you're always vulnerable. Um, always remember. So, Joe, tell us about your trip in the last minute. Well, well, my wife is British. She lives in Wales, so we'll be going over there for a couple of months. But um, we will be doing some things over there. I, I will be speaking at an anti NATO will be holding a summit in Madrid. I'll be speaking at uh, the um, protests and alternative summit that the people will be doing in Madrid. Um, and uh, I will be speaking there, and then we'll be traveling throughout um, a couple of countries. We'll be meeting with uh, colleagues and comrades that uh, I know of and have met in the anti-war movement, but also visiting family and friends. And my wife's uh, son is in Germany. We'll end up there, where one of the people that we'll see is uh, another founder of Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace, who um, is now living there, Michael um, uh, Rice, who is a very interesting man. He's a very old man at this point mm -hmm. in the 90s, but he was uh, a Jew in Germany under World War um, uh, II. He was in, in kindergarten and um, his mother got him out to, uh, um, to uh, uh, the Netherlands, Holland, before he uh, 
before they closed down the school and the Nazis took over completely. But every other member of that school, which was a Jewish school, was killed. Um, but he got out. But when he was in the Netherlands, when Germans bombed the Netherlands, he, he was under the bombing. And he's all his life feared sound, big bombs and sounds because of that. He experienced PTSD as a little kid. Now he's back in, in, in Germany and he's living the rest of his life uh, there now for personal reasons. So we'll get to see him too and that will be nice. Right. So our time is up and of course this has been an enlightening conversation. You've been listening to Joe Lombardo and Scott Ritter. I'm Cynthia Pooler. This is Issues That Matter with Cynthia. And if you like this uh, channel, please subscribe and leave your comments. Your comments are great. Thank you guys for participating. And thank you everybody for listening. Have a wonderful day.